Hello, I'm Luke Pecorero, and I am the Director of Archaeology at Drayton Hall, here 12 miles north of the city of Charleston, South Carolina. Today, we're coming to you from one of the finer rooms in Drayton Hall, a circa 1738 uh, Palladian build. Um, this is one of the finest wrought examples of Palladian architecture in the North American colonies, uh, built by John Drayton. Um, and we are going to introduce you to a little bit about the space, about the importance of the house, and talking about tea. Uh, so just to kind of get you situated, by 1738, when John Drayton begins to execute Drayton Hall, Charleston is a burgeoning seaport that is cosmopolitan in nature. You have goods floating in from all over the place uh, throughout the, uh, the known world, and you have a lot that's being exported from Charleston's burgeoning economy as well. Rice, indigo, cotton, all flowing out of this port, so it really does create a very dynamic environment where you do have luxury items that are coming in and out and the planter class here in Charleston is certainly trying to emphasize that point when you come into a building like Drayton Hall. While we don't know a whole heck of a lot about John Drayton's early aspirations in his life, we do know that by the time he builds Drayton Hall, a vast amount of wealth has passed through the Drayton family hands. And this room is certainly an example of that. Uh, not only do you have fine woodwork, um, the mantle, over mantle, and every other embellishment that you see here from a hand-carved uh, plaster ceiling to mahogany embellishments above each of the window frames, this space is definitely meant to tell you that the Drayton family is in a position of prominence within the colony. We're in here to talk about tea because this room uh, was likely used as a drawing room. So a space that people would have withdrawn to later in the day to observe the uh, tea ceremony, which was typically a gendered activity geared towards women and other family members. And if you were fortunate enough to be invited back here for afternoon tea, uh, you would have seen this space with the light filtering and, and different teawares set out across the room, and you could have enjoyed a nice quiet period of uh, conversation and reflection. As you can see, the, drawings, the drawing room space that we are standing in right now is in an unrestored state. You don't see furniture and you don't see wall hangings or anything else that would have normally adorned this room. The preservation ethos that we have at Drayton Hall is different from some of the other historic sites that you might be used to visiting, and that in 1974, when the National Trust for Historic Preservation ended up buying Drayton Hall from original members of the family who owned it, uh, going back through the long line of Drayton family members to 1738, decided to sell it off uh, without any of the uh, original furnishings. There have been some that have come back to the uh, Drayton Hall Preservation Trust, but uh, the idea was that the space, um, since it hadn't been wired for plumbing, air conditioning, or any modern conveniences, would be left as it was. And we preserve in place, we don't aim to restore, but we try to learn as much as we possibly can about the space and its occupants. So when you're thinking about this room and trying to mentally populate it with people who would have been here in the 18th and 19th century, it becomes a challenge, uh, and we have to rely on our preservation methods, um, archaeological fieldwork, and the documentary evidence to really be able to get back at who would have been using this space. So let's again turn to T. Uh, thinking about how this room might have been used and who might have likely occupied it, it's very likely that this room might have some aspirations in its architectural style and design drawn from Margaret Glenn, who was the third wife of John Drayton, the wife of uh, former South Carolina Royal Governor James Glenn, um, who came from Scotland. So you do seem to see some influences in this space, perhaps, that Margaret might have herself uh, laid her hands to. Now, Margaret Glenn perishes in 1772. So this is a year before the Charleston Tea Crisis and the Tea Acts take place. Uh, that being said, the people that likely would have been taking tea in this space included Margaret uh, prior to her death, um, but then it's also highly likely 
that William Henry Drayton, the eldest son of John Drayton, who later becomes uh, an important figure in the Continental Congress and the run-up to, um, to American independence, uh, his bride, Dorothy Golightly Drayton, might have also entertained people in this space too. We don't know exactly where William Henry Drayton and Dorothy were living uh, in the run-up to 1773, but we know from the documentary record that they did spend time in and around Drayton Hall. So it's likely that Dorothy could have been entertaining people in this space. When we think about this space and the logistics of being able to provide a tea service, we are on the first floor of Drayton Hall. There is a full-size cellar to this space where one could walk upright, and it was in that location where there's a large hearth where water would have been boiled to be able to afford the possibility of making tea in a space like this. Now, it is highly, highly unlikely that the Drayton women would have been producing tea themselves and making it and brewing it and bringing it up here, which means that on a plantation the size of Drayton Hall, this all would have been done by members of the enslaved workforce. Many of the slaves themselves did live in the basement uh, where they were responsible for not only cooking, cleaning, keeping house, and serving family, but they also would have been an integral part to the tea ceremony as it took place in Drayton Hall and in this space itself. Now, it's also worth pointing out that it is quite a distance from the cellar of the house, walking upstairs with hot water to be able to make the tea and then get into this space virtually unnoticed, which was what the role of the enslaved household staff would have likely performed. That makes the tea service and the tea ceremony in this space all that more unique and all that much more of a production.